acid base extraction. Uh, Dichlorobethane typically halogenated solvents are more dense than, than water. Okay, more dense than density uh, greater than one. They'll usually be on the bottom. Most other organic solvents like ether, ethyl acetate, those are typically be on top. Um, okay. Now, these two compounds, when they're neutral, are going to prefer the dichloromethane because organic compounds like organic salt. So how can we get one of them to go into the water? If we can get one to go into the water and one to remain in the dichloromethane, then we'll have one in each layer. Then we can manually separate the layers and we'll have separated the compounds. Because after we separate the layers, we can remove the dichloromethane because it's a solvent and it can be boiled off. And we can also get the compound out of here. Okay, so how can we get one to go into the water? Here's the take home. If you can get one to become an ion and become ionic, then it'll prefer to be in the water. How can we get one of these to become an ion? Well, typically acid-base chemistry. Okay. And the two compounds here, are either one of them acidic or basic? Which one is which? Exactly. The top one is a carboxylic acid. Okay, it's an acid. Is this acidic? Yes. It looks acidic. Yes. Okay, we have to talk about acids. Anything with an H can be acidic if you've got a strong enough base. All right, we're under aqueous conditions. I clarified what a good base was. It was what? An anion or a nitrogen that's sp3 or sp2? Okay. First off, are either of these basic? Are either of these anions? Do either of these have uh, sp3 or sp2 nitrogen? No. Neither of these are basic. That means they're not going to react with acid and make a salt, an ion. But one of them is acidic. That one's acidic. Why is that not acidic? Well, when we say acidic, there's a difference between being acidic. Do you, is water acidic? It can be. But do you call water an acid? No. You see the difference? It can be, but you don't. So that's the same thing we have here. What do you call an acid? When do you call something an acid? Well, here's how, over the past 200 years, the cutoff has been. If it has a pKa lower than blood pH. Okay? Blood pH is about 7. If it has a pKa below 7, it's called an acid. In general. What's the pKa of an alcohol? It's the same as water. 16. See, it's not below 7. <coughs> now, even that pH, that, that, that's very vague and even not quite right for some reason. But that's just like water. It's not an acid. And when we're under aqueous conditions, this idea has got to be an acid. Now, that's an acid because we call it a carboxylic acid. What's its pKa? About 4 to 5. Okay? That's below 7. It's an acid. Okay. The acid will react with the base. And when it reacts with the base, what happens here? Well, that's your old acid base mechanism. This is the acid. See, that's condensed right there, okay? It's really carbon <coughs> double bond O, OH, okay, right? And here's the hydroxide. We put that in there. What does the base do? It takes something. What does it take? These electrons bond here. These electrons move there. What do you get? You get now CO. What is this O now? See, I've got an extra long pair, and it's minus. Uh, what did we make here? We made something. What did we make here? Water. We actually made water. Now, there's some sodium here. because we're using sodium hydroxide, the sodium just sits with the minus. And there's your ion pair. But that's just this, in a condensed. We can make the acid ionic by an acid-base reaction. You're not going to do this. Ah. Oh, Let's judge the, PK, uh, the equilibrium up here. Is this going to be complete up here? How do we judge that? What's the pKa of the acid, of the acid on this side? About 5. What's the pKa of the acid over here? Which one's the acid over here? 
What's its pKa? What side's favored? 16 by how much? 10 to the 11. That's, a, that's 10 billion. See, it's going to the right by 10 billion. See, this pKa is 16. If you add this with sodium hydroxide, you'll have 16 and 16. Now, you might say half of it's ionized. It doesn't work. Though. To do a reaction pKa, you need a difference of about 2 to 3. Okay. This needs to be like 10 to work. Uh, I told you 7 at the beginning. And really, 10 would, 10 would work. Alcohols, no. So under, under basic conditions, one of these is an ion, the sodium salt, the other is still neutral. It'll prefer to remain in the or organic layer, but if you shake these up, this one's going to want to migrate up here to the water because it's ionic, and indeed the take home here is ionics are going to like water better. Even though it's still got a lot of organic to it, and it is an organic ion, okay, ion's going to prefer water, just boom. Whether it's a sodium ion or a carboxylate organic <coughs> ion. So now you shake it up, they separate. At this point, you just separate your layers. You can drain one layer into one flask, one layer into the other flask, and you've separated your compounds. How do you get the alcohol back? It's in dichloromethane. You just distill off the dichloromethane, evaporate it dry. This compound won't evaporate. It'll be left in your flask. Up here, how do you get this back? Well, you could boil off the water. If you boil off the water, it would be in that form there. It'd still be the sodium salt. It's not going to all of a sudden become that again. How are we going to get the H back on? What do you want to add to this? Strong acid. To, what's your favorite strong acid? Okay, you can add some HCl. What's going to happen? Well, that's a minus. Anion. Anions are bases. Base is going to take the H. This, this is a strong. Uh, once you give an H to something, what are we going to get? I'm just going to call that aromatic. You're going to get, you're going to put that back on. Okay? I mean, I can show the mechanism. These electrons take the H, these move on to chlorine, so we make that plus Cl minus. There's a sodium there. Now the sodium sits with this, and you got sodium chloride, but now you're back to neutral. Ah, this is all in water. Now, actually, in this case, is this still soluble in water? Maybe. But it's now neutral. Typically, this will separate from the water. This will typically precipitate. If you're lucky. Sometimes it won't. Very often, though, you add the acid, it goes neutral, and it doesn't like the water anymore, and it precipitates if it's a solid. And if it precipitates, how do you isolate it? You just filter, and the water would go through. You don't have to boil the water off. You just filter the solid up. So you'd have solid there, and this would be in the flask after you boil off the dichloromethane. Using acid-based chemistry to separate compounds by extraction, the main idea being if you can get one to become an ion, it will go into the water. If the other stays neutral, it will stay in your organic. Questions about this? Certainly do extractions at some point in the lab. Step funnel, one of the most expensive uh, class of items in your drawer. Methane is one solvent you could use. What are some others? Extracting aqueous solution. Okay. It's amazing the little the little uh, tidbits I put in the tin are meant to be informative and tell you the important information. Okay. Um, Cycloalkanes. Let's see. Did we name this guy over here? 
I think we named that one. Did we name that one? No. Anybody got a name for that one? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Anybody got a name for it? I'll get you what you get. Five ethyl um, methyl. Five ethyl methyl. Five ethyl methyl? Methyl. So this is going to be a complex set of parentheses and you call it nuffle. Ethyl? Yeah. This looks like the nuffle's on the ethyl, but is it on the one carbon or the two carbon? Two methyl ethyl isn't right because the two methyl ethyl is actually a propyl. Let's finish it out. What else did you get? Um, six propyl. Six propyl. Decane. So it's ten. Let's see here. One two three four five six seven eight nine. One two three four five six seven eight nine ten. One two three four five six seven. Eight, nine, is it just 10 straight through there? Is there another 10? Both of these happen to be straight through there. That, that, that's kind of just a... Okay, what's on there? Is there another 10? Okay, on the 10 there's two subs. This is a propyl. What is that? Well, coming off is 1. And that's 2, but we can get longer this way. 1, 2, 3. So that is a propyl coming off. What's on the propyl? A methyl at what position? One. So this is a one methyl propyl. That's a one methyl propyl. If I see it, it's a one methyl propyl. I mean, if that wasn't there, it'd just be a propyl coming off. But it's a propyl that has a methyl on it. And the methyl's at the one position. It looks to me like we have a propyl and a one methyl propyl. Now, what's the one position? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. If we come this way, that's five, six. You start with the M or the P and L. We come this way, it's one, two, three, four. Oh, it's five, six that way also. Okay, is it going to be five, six or five, six? How do we, how do we determine? Alphabetical. Which comes first, propyl or methyl propyl? Okay, so D5 would be right, but I'll get you this should be 5, 1 methyl propyl, and then 6 propyl decane. Yeah, you got something to 5 and something to 6. The complex sub goes in parentheses. Aaron? Can you please take uh, a sec U? Common name, common name for this is sec butyl. Okay, so can you use that also? If, if you were allowed to use common names, that's a sec butyl group. Um, sec butyl, whenever there's a dash, sec dash butyl, the sec doesn't count in um, okay. alphabetical. So it would still come before propyl. It'd be, it'd be five. Sec butyl, six purple decade. If you're allowed to use common names. Because when you common names, it's a four carbon fragment, and so it's a sec butyl. But complex is a one methyl propyl. Is there anything else on that page that we didn't do? We also have alkyl halides. Of a common name. Halo alkanes is more the IE pack. So you might call alkyl bromide versus a bromo alkane. Putting the halogen first is the IE pack way.
basically you name these just like you did before, where the halogen is just a substituent. Okay? And, so, and, the, and they're not named with a YL ending, they're named with an O ending, like bromo. Okay, what's the longest continuous carbon chain here? Three, okay, you see this This is just a, uh, what we got here, propane? What's on the propane? Obviously bromo, what position? Well, the end is, one position is an end, is it, which end is it? Doesn't matter, it's the same, one, two, three, what we got here? Two bromo propane. And so it's a halo alkane. Halo for halogen, alkane. Halo alkane. So what is this? Chloroethane. <coughs> Two carbon chain. Please don't count that as a carbon. I see lots of students want to call it propyl for some reason. I don't see, there's no three carbon chain here. It's two carbon chain. So if it has a substituent on there. Question. If it's at the end, you won't have the number. Don't need a number. Why don't you need a number? What if the chlorine is on this side? What would that be called? There's, that's not unambiguous, or it is not, or it is ambiguous. It's not ambiguous. You don't need a number here. Is there a such thing as two chloroethane? So I say, yeah. What is two chloroethane? This? No, this is this is one chloroethane. That's the same molecule put to them. You don't actually need a number there because there's no isomer. No isomer for the isomer. Yeah, there's an isomer up here. What is this? It's one bromopropane. Right? So the two is needed there. But you've got to say, where's the bromine? The chlorine can only be one place. Right? Now you can put the one, but it's, it's not needed. If I say it's not needed? Is the one needed in the longer ones? In which one? Like the bromopropane, it's not just assumed that that's one, or it's always had the one if it's... No, it's, it's... Is this unambiguous? Or do you have to wonder or question? Yes. If I said bring me some bromopropane from the lab and you brought me this, I'd say, well, that's bromopropane, that's two. No. Maybe you can put an N in front of it, but that's not I effect. Um, it's kind of straight chain, okay? Um, which one do you want to name? Fluorine or the ionochlorine? You want to name this one? Yeah. I'll let you name that one on your own. Longest continuous chain. One, two, three. Or one, two, three. I see that. That's a. That only give you one sub. That's what? That only give you one sub. There's only one sub on that. If I do this, one, two, three, it's got two subs. Which one do you want to go with? Two subs. Yeah, that there. Okay, so three is what? Propane, what's on the propane? A fluoro and a methyl. What's the one in? Right or left? Here. So you get one and two. If that was it, the subs would be two and three. Alphabetical, F or methyl, be one fluoro, fluoro, two methyl, propane. We do what now? We don't start the one at the end. We started the one at the end. You don't start. <laughs> We're numbering the carbon chain. <laughs> Fluorine is not part of the propane. That's a substituent that happens just to be on the one carbon. Okay? I mean, if this was one, that would be two, and that'd be three, and that'd be four, and you'd have four carbon chain. Well, I mean, it's not a butane, and that's not a carbon. That's a substituent on the one position. Um, like I said two minutes ago, that's a common mistake. Okay? 
You're looking at the longest continuous carbon chain. There's an extra ethyl in the end, that's not part of the carbon chain. Now if that was a methyl, like a CH3, first off I probably wouldn't draw it in, but then it would be one, two, three, four carbons. But it's not a carbon, it's an F. I'll let you do the one over there on your other. Okay, that's all the nomenclature we're going to do. Laura? Um, do you still use alphabetical order, or do the fluorines and chlorines like, always come before your other? Did we not put in alphabetical order? Well, I'm like, if. No. If we we're, had st we're still using alphabetical. alphabetical. Okay. I should have put the F before the M. Did I do that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, still alphabetical. Um, that's all the nomenclature we're going to do for the test. I, I give you below just because we may hear some alcohols or ethers. I cover this nomenclature in organic uh, two. Just kind of see, this is a four carbon alcohol. It's called butanol. You, instead of the ane, it's an OL on the end. So you just get a little uh, glimpse of some other nomenclature. But we're just doing through alkyl halides on this hand up. Okay? Uh, we may have mentioned this before, but make sure you know how to deal with condensed formulas or so-called condensed structures. It's not a line bond. It's also not just like C something, A something, O. It's sort of in between where they're trying to, they give you a little bit of information about structure, but you need to be able to turn this into a structure. A lot of times you see parentheses. There's two methyl groups. CH3 is a methyl. Two methyl groups. What's bonded to what? I mean, y'all see the two methyls aren't just bonded to each other. That would just bonded be, to that they're bonded to that carbon. So let's have a carbon there with two methyls. I'll draw it out as CH3. I ended up doing this, but let me tell you just something to look out for. Whenever you draw things like this with a bond, make sure you draw the atom that's connected right here on the end, okay? Don't do something like this. It looks like the carbon is bonded to what? To the three? To the H? Just be a little bit more precise with your structure. And so that's bonded to the carbon, and that happens to have three H's on it. You don't have to draw the three bonds out to the H. You can draw it condensed there, okay? But I see that all the time. Just uh, students just draw groups here. It's like, what's bonded to the carbon? Um, okay. And see, I drew the three on this side so the carbon could be bonded. So what we have here is this carbon is actually bonded to two methyls. What else is it bonded to? Bonded to an H. Then it's bonded to the next carbon, and that carbon is bonded to what? Two H's. Two H's. And then what? OH. Then you can turn this into a line bond, and you have basically boom, boom, and it's the same thing over there, and that carbon, and then the OH. Where, yes, there's two H's there. Okay? You guys on the left do the second one, you guys on my right do the third one.
Okay, let's do the one in the middle. I got I got three CH3s. Those three CH3s are connected to all each other. Carbon. They're connected to that carbon there. So we have carbon with three CH3s. And there's that carbon, which is there. And that carbon is apparently attached, let's say, we can always do something and then step back and look. If you step back and look and you've got five bonds to a carbon, then something ain't right. But then this, and that's that carbon. What's that carbon bonded to? Two CH3s again. I mean, when you have a CH3, you can only be bonded to one other thing, because that's the fourth bond. Then what? It's like these two are like here, and then that's bonded to that. And so that's, I want to come here so I can write CH2, and that's bonded to what? Another carbon, and that's bonded to an H, and that's bonded to an O. Yes, it's actually like this. The CHO is your aldehyde group condensed. Okay? That's how it out a condensed, that's an aldehyde, right? That's a CHO. It's condensed like that. If we draw that line bond, we have a carbon with three methyls. That's like a T butyl group. And so that's going to be like boom, boom, boom. That's a carbon with three methyls. Connected to something. See, that's a terbutyl, but it's connected to carbon, and that carbon is connected to two methyls. You can draw it down. A lot of times your methyls are both kind of drawn to the same side. Then there's a CH2. Two H's there. We're not going to draw them though. And then that's bonded to a carbon that has a double bond there, and then the H. One thing, with aldehydes, I prefer to draw in the H of an aldehyde. Okay? And many, many chemist books do. A couple don't. Okay? So that's that one. Questions about that one? Every carbon got four bonds. Saw a good number of five carbon, five bonded carbons on the quiz. A lot of nitrogens with ten and twelve electrons around it. Nitrogen is row two. It's only got eight, uh, four orbitals. It can only hold eight. Okay, what we got here? CH three to carbon. Okay, CH three carbon. That carbon's got what on it? Looks like it's two methyls. Okay. Can I switch to an ME? Well, that's what I do. But I'll just quickly draw. What do I mean by ME? Methyl. Okay? Is that any different than writing CH3-3? CH3-3? Yeah, like the first one, the one up there. Is that something? If you do CH3-C, CH3-2, is it the same thing as CH3-3-C? Uh, this is three methyls on a carbon. This is one methyl on a carbon with two methyls on that carbon. Oh, I see what you mean. It's actually also two methyls on that carbon because that's that's the other two bonds. Yeah, this could have been written the same way. I don't know why it's like that, or if I did that, or if I got a problem from somewhere like that. Yeah, this could have been condensed like that. Or maybe I just wanted to do it different so you can see it differently. So that's what it ends up being. By no methyls or CH3s, right? Okay. Uh, what else we got? Then it's bonded to, it looks like that carbon. What is this condensed? Carbon. That's actually a carboxylic acid. Okay. CO2H or COOH. It's carboxylic acid condensed. You saw that over here, right? You see the COOH? 
That could have also been written CO2H. Is it possible to use a condensed formula to describe one that has a complex substructure? And so there's your, it's a, basically it's a T-butyl group over here, right? Carboxylic acid coming off. To describe a complex structure? Like one that has a substructure that has the branching in the substructure? Can you do that with a condensed formula? Possibly. I mean, make it so cumbersome that it's hard to do. I was curious how you would even write that. Again, there's no real rule. I mean, if you can do it and it works and it's unambiguous, then yeah, it can be done. If it gets so cumbersome, you're like, ah, I'll just, I'll just draw the structure. Okay? So you'll see lots of condensed structures. You'll see structures in a variety of ways. Partially condensed, fully condensed, all the way down to just pure formula, which would be CH alphabetical. See, this gives you some information. It's not full line bond. Uh, okay. Let's look at the idea of primary, secondary, tertiary carbons. This is the same as with the nitrogens and stuff. A primary carbon is bonded to how many other carbons? One. One. Okay. A quaternary carbon is bonded to how many other carbons? Four. Four. Okay. See that carbon right there? That's a quaternary carbon. It's attached to four others. What type of carbon is that right there? Primary, because it's bonded to one other. That's a secondary carbon, because it's bonded to two carbons. Just terminology so we can describe carbons. Uh, just like this, secondary mean. The nitrogen is bonded to two carbons, so it's called a secondary mean. But that's a primary amine, because the nitrogen is bonded to just one carbon. We can then say H's. A primary CH is just an H that's on a primary carbon. So how many primary CH's in this compound? Chemistry, reactions. Well, alkanes are pretty boring in terms of reactions. They don't have long pairs, they don't have pi bonds. These are the two main reactive features. When we get to alkanes, we'll see plenty of reactions. What can you do with an alkane? Well, you can burn them. And, uh, of course, burning the 
why Canes is hugely important to us, right? We heat our homes with uh, natural gas, which contains lots of uh, hydrocarbons. Burn the grills with, uh, light your grill with propane. Okay? Basically, you take butane, you can combust it with oxygen. Okay, it reacts with oxygen, you need a little catalyst, a little spark or something to get it going. All the carbons are converted to CO2 and all the H's are converted to water. And while it's burning, this is steam, and you don't see the water, it'll be in the atmosphere. Okay. Both of those, both of these are going to be gases, right? That's going to be a gas because it's, uh, it's probably going to be pretty hot on the Texas Thermal. Now that's probably a radical reaction. Okay? Radical reactions are hard to describe mechanistically. You can balance that if you want. I mean, you got four carbons over here, you're going to make four CO2s. Plus heat, exothermic. Okay. Uh, another common reaction we're not going to look at here, but uh, you can also do radical halogenation. For example, you can react an alkane with bromine. Typically, you need a little light energy. And you can brominate this and produce HBr in a balanced reaction. Basically, it looks like this H is being replaced with Br. It's a substitution reaction. Okay? And then the other Br apparently teams up with the H to make HBr. So this tertiary hydrogen here will undergo radical bromination or the tertiary carbon group, really. Tertiary carbon and it goes radical bromination. This is very standard. Up there, you're kind of uh, putting oxygens on all the carbons. This is more selective and just like one equivalent. Again, this, is, uh, this will be looked at at some point along the way. Really, that's about the, all, the, all the chemistry you can do with alkane. Okay. Let's look a little bit closer at cycloalkanes. We named these a little bit already. Cyclopropane, three-membered ring. There's larger rings possible. This table shows heats of formation. Heat of formation is the energy that is taken up or released whenever the compound is theoretically made from just the elements. So if you take carbon plus hydrogen, you know, hydrogen is diatomic, okay? And put the carbons and start bonding the C and the H's together. The heat of formation is your thermodynamic number for that reaction from the elements. Now usually when you make compounds from the elements, it's going to be an exothermic reaction because you're starting to make bonds. And when you make bonds, it's a good thing. So it's exothermic. It gives off energy as opposed to... Okay? And most and your your main rings are, are HF here, we're looking at 10 cal per mole, are negative. What does a negative HF mean? The negative of cyclonex say negative 29.5. What does that mean? It means when you make cyclohexane from carbon and hydrogen, it gives off 29.5 kcals per mole. Exothermal. If something's exothermic, it means what you're making is more stable than what you started with. But look at the first two. These are actually positive heats of formation. What does that mean? Whenever you make cyclopropane, it doesn't give off 12.7. What does it do? It requires 12.7. So does butane. Why do these two require? It's written there. Somebody tell me. Why do they require? 
it implies they're less stable. Because you're actually having to force it to do it. Okay, why? Because we have angle strain. All right? Cyclopropane has 60 degree bond angles. Okay, that comes from ninth grade geometry. But, it, but this carbon wants to be what, what bond angle? There is two H's there, right? Yeah. See, it wants to be 109.5, but because it's in this ring, it's like it has to be 60. So something's got to give. Something, it's not liking that. Ring angle strain causes the molecule to be high energy. And basically, when you make it, you have to put energy so these, this strain ring can uh, be formed. We see that in the HF. HF can be determined in lab. And now we know something about the, ultimately, the stability. Now you may say, is cyclopropane not stable? No, it's actually pretty stable. In fact, as I mentioned before, lots of drugs contain cyclopropane rings. In fact, the, look on your lab manual cover. I got the lab manual? Pretty sure that drug has a cyclopropane, right? On the far right? No, lots of drugs do. Can be made so that's HF the idea of using HF to to kind of uh, assess stability of your product uh, starting with the elements okay let's look at uh, some other things about rings focusing on cyclohexane six membered rings I substitute. Two substituents happen to be methyls. If there was just one substituent, there would be no isomer. Just methyl cyclohexane. Put the methyl in where you want, it's the same compound. If we have two, now we have relative considerations. They can be adjacent to each other, one, two, that'd be called a one, two isomer. This would be called one, three, this would be called one, four. Three different constitutional isomers. Different connectivity, different name. Now we can take this a step further. If we look at the 1, 2 isomer, the two methyls can actually be cis. See, this is bold. It means both of those bonds are coming out. Why do we need a coming out there? Why not just draw it like that? Well, that's tetrahedral. And we have two in the plane, one forward, one back, right? What's going back on this carbon? Yeah, see, there's an H going back, and there's an H going back here. That's shown in. But in this case, both the methyl groups are going forward. You can also have this. They can both be going back. Both of these are called cis, or same side. And those would be called the cis isomers. And when we talk about cis, we're comparing it to trans. Trans is opposite. One forward, one back, or one back, one forward. Now, is, do you name them? That's only for comparing between those two. Because there will be a difference between the two cis ones, right? As far as reactivity goes. This is the same compound. Yeah, same compound, okay? Same compound. All right. These are different. That will be test two. Okay, we'll look closely at steric chemistry. Right now, what do we need to do? First off, are these two constitutional isomers? No. They're both one, two, uh, dimethyl cyclohexane. They don't differ in connectivity. The methyls are both connected at the shoulders. It's just over here. Both are forward, but here, or both are forward, over here, one's forward and one's back. They're both still connected to the shoulders. Okay, same connectivity. If you name them, this is 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane. That's 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane. Same number. I told you before, these are stereoisomers. Stereoisomers only differ with a descriptor in the front. 
What's the descriptor for this for this guy? Cis. What's the descriptor for this guy? Trans. Now these two are actually different. This requires an additional descriptor. And that's test two. Okay, so that's just sort of uh, some we need to know, others a little bit of foreshadowing. So drugs with cycloalkanes, six membered rings, we see one here with a cyclobutane and a cyclopropane used to that uh, ring there. Okay. Do you know how that strainless heat of formation is from? Or is that something? Good work. Where it said they had that, that chart of strainless heat of formation that was suggesting that they could measure that without the strain. Do you know how that is determined? Uh, I'd have to look at it. Uh, I didn't really go into those all the numbers. Um, okay. Sort of two main major topics we're going to cover here is uh, we, we talked about when you have carbon carbon single bond, single bond, when you have rotation as possible. Sarah? On the last page, there's like a little squiggly bond. Squiggly bond means it can be coming forward or back. Okay. And they're kind of telling you that. Okay. Uh, it's a generic way to show a, a bond. Uh, rotation. And so let's look at this. These different rotations can be called rotamers, but more differently, this is called conformations. How will this exist? Well, guess what? It'll exist in the most stable. Not 100%, but that'll be the preferred. We have to have some terminology here to discuss this as this rotates around. Um, this is an ethyl, okay? Uh, and the ethyl, okay, right here. I got ethyls drawn on the page here. I'll take it from the textbook. We're dealing with ethane here, okay? Two carbons. Uh, usually black implies another carbon here, but I'm just going to call these three H's coming off this and three H's coming off this. And each carbon is tetrahedral. Two in the plane, one forward, one back. <coughs> okay. Ethane. Well, I think it, these carbons can rotate. How, are, how is they going, one carbon going to exist relative to the other? For example, they could be like this, where this H is sort of lined up with that one. Or this could rotate like this, where there's no H lined up with that one. First off, terminology. What do we want to call it when that H is lined up with that one? It's sort of like if you look through here, I can't see the H behind it. Just like I can't see the sun because the moon's in front of me. Eclipsed. Okay? When they're, when they're lined up, they're called eclipsed. You see? You can't see the H behind it, as opposed to. Because this H is eclipsed by that one. Alright? But what if I rotate this and look at this confirmation? Is this an eclipse confirmation? No, that H is not, nothing's eclipsing, that H is not eclipsing anything. Is that H eclipsing anything? No. Well, let's turn it like this. No. You see, they're all, there's no eclipsed confirmation. What do you want to call that one? Non-eclipsed? Well, other than non-eclipsed, what do you want to call it? Staggered. Okay, that's called a staggered confirmation. Now, which is better, to be eclipsed or staggered? Staggered's actually better because there's mainly electrons here, okay, on the outer here. The electrons want to be furthest away. Okay, you might, in this model, you might say, well, is that really further away? Well, okay, it is. Staggered is going to give more room. Staggered's always going to be better. Now, how, now for ethane, I'm going to hold the back carbon still. How many different conformations can I get? Well, the first answer is a hundred gazillion. It, it's infinite because, see, that's a different conformation. 
and that's a different confirmation. And that's a different, okay? But we're not going to do all 100 gazillion. We're going to go to ones that we can define. That's called eclipsed. Let's rotate to staggered. How much did we rotate this? Because if I go from here to here, what is that rotation? That's 180. And all the way back around, I did a whole turn 360. When I go from here to here, how much did I rotate? No, I went from here. If I went there, that would be 90, right? I didn't go that far. I went, I went almost. I didn't go that far, I went right here. Completely, so it's, it's all right. How much did I rotate? 60. 60, right? Let's keep an eye on that guy there. Because if it's 60, I need to do three of those to get 180. No. Well, you split half of 122 for the back. Yeah. Let's see, if I go here, there, that's 180. What is, how much did I rotate? If I go there, then I could go there. That's 120. Then I could go there. It should be 180. So I did three there to get to 180. So 180 divided by three is 60. So each one must have been 60. That make sense? All right. So 60 degree turn would give you staggered. Now let's do another 60 degree turn. What does that give you? Eclipse. Is that eclipse any different than this eclipse? No. It's actually not with that thing. If there was something here, we'll talk about that. Okay? Eclipse, staggered, eclipsed. That's staggered. But let's ask, is that staggered any different than that staggered? No, it's not here. Okay? Eclipsed, staggered, eclipsed. We did a full round and round. How many different confirmations did we really do? We really only did two. Because that eclipsed is actually the same as that eclipse. All right, we really only did two confirmations. Each one has an energy, a potential energy. Okay, energy. Which one is higher energy? Eclipse is higher energy because these electrons are like, oh, I don't like this. Okay, and then you turn it and they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm all right now. Oh, I don't like that. Okay, I'm all right now. Up there, okay. Now we can actually graph that, and that's shown over here. Ah, before we look at that, we need to learn how to draw these. How are we going to draw that on the board? All right, draw that on the board. All right, there's different ways to draw. Different ways to draw. The way that we've been drawing already is sort of like this, right? Tetrahedral, two in the plane, one forward, one back. That's called a perspective drawing. 3D. More often it's called perspective drawing. Another way to draw is a sawhorse. I don't do any much sawhorse, but occasionally you'll see it out there. Okay, sometimes it may rear its head on an ugly MCAT exam or something. Alright. Sawhorse is where, well, first off, this one is like this. Where you got an H straight down. See H straight up, H straight down, and then on that carbon you got one forward and one back. And they're kind of going up a little bit. Then over here you've got one forward, but it's sort of going down. Okay, you see that's just that. Here, it's sort of like drawn like this. With, and they got, problem is in sawhorse, that looks flat like a trigonal planar. It's not. That carb is actually, these, these bonds are kind of coming towards me. I look through there. And that's the, that's the bond. You're kind of looking through there, but you drew it sort of like that. All right? Now, that's 
that's like this. But whenever I showed it to you, we were looking down the carbon so we could see the eclipse. So we gotta, we gotta draw it like that. You wanna look at this as if you're looking through here. That's the, me looking through there is the same as if you're looking through there like that. You see a carbon with an H straight up. Okay? We're going to look through there. Alright. This is also called the circle, circle, dot, dot method. Remember that? Alright. We've got a big circle and then a dot in the middle. The dot in the middle is the first carbon. We're trying to draw that looking straight on. Okay? Looking through there. On the first carbon, alright, I see an H straight up. If I see an H straight up on the front carbon? This is the front carbon, H straight up. On the front carbon, what do you see going to the right? Well, all these are H's. See an H point to the right? It's also going a little bit down. Okay? H to the right, we're going a little bit down. There's also an H to the left going a little bit down. That's that front carbon. Is that what you see on the front carbon? Now again, that looks like it's flat on the board. All these H's are actually coming towards you a little bit. That has to be just implied. Okay, now what do you see on the back carbon? I'll do it like this here. Let's draw this confirmation. What do you see on the back carbon? First off, you can't see the back carbon because it's eclipsed. But you can see the bond coming out. See, there's an H coming out between these. From your view, that's to your left, correct? See, back in the back, I see an H coming out through these. It's staggered between those. To draw the H, the bonds in the back, you draw them off of the circle. It's kind of like you can't see that carbon back there because it's eclipsed, but you can see the H coming out. I'm drawing this here. That's what I'm drawing. And there's also an H coming out here. And where's the last H? It's going straight down. Now it's not straight down, it's actually going towards the fall. You draw it like this. There you go. There's ethane. That's two carbons. One in the front and one in the back. And there is a, this is a Newman projection of ethane. Because along the way some chemists were like, okay, we're going to have to figure out how to draw this on the board. But I can't stand here and show it to you every time. Okay. And you need to be able to put this on paper. And Newman from Ohio State did this. Uh, okay. We can see this is staggered. See how this H is in between the back two H's? Now let's draw it. I'm going to keep the front carbon the same with the H up. Let's draw it with the, the back carbon, H also straight up, and so it's eclipsed. How would we do that? Circle, circle, dot, dot. The front is the same, so I'm just going to draw it the same. <coughs> now, if it was totally eclipsed, that would be it, because do you see the second H behind that one? We're well, not supposed to be able to see it because it's eclipsed. Can you see the second H behind that one? Not if it's exactly eclipsed. But it's like we don't know if anything's back there. So when we draw our clips, we actually draw them a little bit to the side, and we end up doing it something like this, where it may not look exactly eclipsed, but we do that just so we can have something up there. And since that one's a little bit to the right, I'm going to draw this one a little bit to the right, and this one a little bit to the, to the right. And so this would be eclipsed. Does that look like what we have in my hand here? The back carbon, H straight up. See, in the back carbon, there's an H going to the left, that side, just like the front. Did I see these? And that's staggered. 
and then we can rotate. Now let's look at that rotation. Questions about that up there? Well, that's the same thing we got here. You see how they got it just a little bit? That's supposed to imply eclipse. So that is where, oh, that's that. Which carbon are they rotating when they come here? Back. Front or back? back? Yeah. So they rotate it. They start out eclipsed, higher in energy. This is just relative, no numbers here. We're just going to compare it to the next one. Then they rotate the back 60 degrees to staggered. As you come to that staggered, you get fully staggered, you go down in energy. Then if we rot rotate more, we get back to what? Eclipse and go back up to the same. And these are the same. These are actually the same in energy and just actually the same because an H is an H. But we're doing a full rotation of the back carbon, 360 degrees. Rotate again, we get what? We get staggered. But see, these are the same in terms of energy. Because an H is an H. And then we rotate again, we get back to that, higher. We come here. And then we get back up there. And I think that that is 360 degrees, and that's really back to that one. If we had made one of those H's red or something. <coughs> and result, how many different confirmations are here? Two. Two. That is named confirmations. Of course, that, 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 there's a million as you just anywhere you want to put. What is the angle, what is the dihedral angle with, uh, when it's eclipsed? Zero. Zero. What's a dihedral angle, also known as a torsional angle? A dihedral angle is the angle between the front bond and the back. Okay? Between here and here, at zero. If this, if this H was here, flat to the side, what's the dihedral angle between this H and here? 90 degrees. 180. 90 degrees, but the other way, okay, that's zero degrees, that's your dihedral angle, that's shown on the previous page over here. For example, in this staggered form, what's the dihedral angle between that H and the back H? You have 60 degrees. Now what's the angle between 1 and 2 that I just numbered? I don't think I've heard it yet. 109.5. Because those H's are on the same carbon, and that's a tetrahedral carbon, 109.5. Okay? Dihedral angles, the H's aren't on the same carbon. It's the plane you get, and you can look at it over here and read about it. Know what a dihedral angle is, or sometimes a cortical angle. Also shown down here. Uh, let's move to, before we look down there, let's move to a different molecule. I'm going to move to butane. Butane. To get to butane, I'm actually going to take off two. And I'm going to make the hydrogens. Like this. I could, have did, I could have did that thing like this and had the hydrogens real small. Three, and we could have rotated like that. You can't see. Now I'm going to put methyls on here. That carbon's got a methyl, and this carbon's got a methyl. So now we got, this is actually a carbon. One, two, three, four. Four carbons. And the two little nubs here are the H's that are on the carbon. They're much smaller. But I can still rotate. Okay? And I can maybe start like this. But now instead of saying that these H's are eclipsed, I'm saying these are carbons that are eclipsing. That will still rotate. So let's start here. Carbons eclipsing, that can't be good. Let's rotate 60 degrees. You want me to rotate the front? 60 degrees. Right there. Now is there anything eclipsing? 
No, you got carbon half here and H this way. And this line, this is lined up between them. It's called staggered. Okay. Now let's rotate another 60. Now do we have anything eclipsed? The methyl and the H are eclipsed. Is that the same? We had a previous, there's eclipsed. The methyls are eclipsed, but now the two, the H and the methyl, are those the same? So here we have the eclipse are different. Which is, which is worse? To have the H and the methyl eclipse or the methyl and the methyl? methyl. Yeah, that's worse. Now you could make an argument that, hey, we might have some uh, Van der Waals attraction here and that's better. But it's, it's actually worse. In confirmation, more room is better. And your Van der Waals argument doesn't hold up, usually. Okay? What about the metals and the, like the hydrogen and the that? When you bend it, when they eclipse something on like that carbon? Oh yeah, when these methyls are eclipsed, the H's are also eclipsed. Down there, I was looking at those. Where you put the H's on the other carbons too? These up here? Uh, we're really not worried about them. We're really looking at uh, the two carbon rotation. Because I'm not really rotating this bond. If I was, I'd be looking there. But yeah, there are some up here. These H's could maybe interfere a little bit, and that's one reason it wants to be away. Let's go all the way through. Basically, we see that eclipsed is different. We have two different eclipses. And methyl's eclipsed is worse than ancient methyl. So if we graph this, that would be higher energy than that. Okay, terminology. What do you, we have two different eclipses. One where the big guys are eclipsed and one where it's a small and a big. What do you want to call it when they're both the big guys are eclipsed? You call it fully eclipsed? Sin. This is also called sin. Sin means same size. Here the methyls are kind of, they're sin. Because the opposite of sin is anti, and anti would be down there. That's sin. Sin is a type of eclipse where your big groups are eclipsed. Your big groups are on the same. You can review this terminology. It's all throughout. We'll use it. Okay? Sin is just a, the worst type of eclipse. We turn it. Turn it again. We get ancient methyl eclipse. Turn it again. Ah, oh, what is that? It's called anti, and guess what? Anti is your best. Because the big groups are totally away from each other, and it's a staggered confirmation. Nothing's eclipsed here. Are these, like on the graphs, are these potential energies all like, theoretical, or is that something that was, like, is this a theory, or is this based off of mathematics and geometry? Yeah. We're just not putting any real numbers on it. Okay? I'm not telling you what the actual energy is. Uh, some, of the, some of this can be calculated in computational, give some actual numbers. We're not putting actual numbers on it. Uh, let's just look at it more qualitatively. Uh, let's look at this. Let me get this put on the right. Here's the graph we want to look at of what we were just doing. And below are the confirmations. Question. What is it called when it's when the hydrogen and the methyl are? Uh, you may ask that because we see it and I didn't talk about it. Um, let's go back here. When the okay, that's that's that would be called sin. It's a totally eclipse. Right here, that's got a name. It's a name for a staggered where the groups are kind of to the side. That is called anti. They're not really to the side of each other. They're kind of opposite. When it's staggered to the side, what's that called? Search for a G. Called Gauss, which is apparently German for to the side. Okay? Gauss is a type of uh, staggered where the big groups are kind of to the side. So there's no name for when that hydrogen is enclosed to the third With that? Somebody may loosely call that a gauge confirmation with the H eclipse or something. Um, I don't know if that's truly called a gauge. Uh, I would call that more of a gauge, but it's, it, it may be loosely, it's both may be. Um, so the H 
it's just anti confirmation it's not like anti stagger or like how no well anti is a type of stagger yeah anti is your best stagger okay okay uh, let's good? let's go through the rotation see if it clears up any questions first off here is a this is where both methyls are straight up and eclipsed okay what what carbon do they rotate they're rotating the front carbon you see Back is staying the same. Now rotate this about 60 degrees. I get that. It's called gauche. Is gauche lower, lower or higher energy than A? Lower. lower. It's lower because it's a stagger. The stagger is always lower than eclipsed. So we go from A down to B. Then we rotate again. Now the front H is eclipsed with the back methyl. That's eclipsed. It's C, but it's not as bad as A. Why is it not as bad as A? Because A, the methyls were both of them, they were eclipsed. Here it's a H in methyls, not as bad as A. When we go to D, now we have what's called anti. That's the best, and so it sits the lowest. Lowest in relative energy. And then we just basically go back to the same. We, we get to this. H in methyl is eclipsed. E is actually the same as what? See, this table actually also calls it to the gauche. They didn't name that one the gauche. Um, this came from a textbook. Uh, we get to the gauche over here. F is the same as B, is that right? And then we get back to A. We did a 360 degree turn. So how many confirmations were actually there in terms of different energy confirmations? I think it was four. We had, what were the names of them? We had fully eclipsed, sin. Does they call that sin? Do they call it sin anywhere? Sin. Gauche. The other uh, eclipse. That's not really gauche anyway. Because the gauche is a type of stagger. That's an eclipse, but it's not fully eclipsed. It's not as bad as that. And then we get to this. Then they start repeating, don't they? Is it E the same as C? Yeah. I think it's four. It's four. There's only four different ones. They start repeating. Ethane had two. This one had four. Okay? Now, I could put other groups on here and end up with like eight. But every one could be different. We're not going to illustrate that. We may see that as we start working the problem. Let's see what we need to do. Uh, questions? On the blue sheet, we can see what we need to do. Right here. Show the following in the lowest energy confirmation. When you're dealing with alkanes and confirmations, you're showing Newman projections. Okay? Basic question is. Show this here in the lowest energy Newman confirmation. You guys on the left do the first one. You guys on my right do the second one. It gives you some directions. Looking down the 1 2 bond. What's the 1 2 bond? Where you have to. No, this is a butane. Which carbon is 1? Right or left? We left. That's where your two subs are. Looking down the 1 2. Alright, let me show you a little man here. A woman. Alright? You want to look down this bond. I mean, here it is. By the way, when you do alkanes, why do you draw them zigzag? Because you're really drawing them anti. Okay. But let's let's say that's that. Let's see. Okay. Uh, there's the backbone. And it's saying look down the one, two. So I want to look down this. Okay. I want to look down. Okay. Now this carbon has a chlorine and a fluorine in a tetrahedral arrangement. For me to look down, I got to get up here. I mean, I can't turn the molecule on the board. If I could, then you could look down it. You could. But what I can do is I can stand up here and look through there. And what do I see? I can draw it. 
So what I want to do is stand here and look down the bond. I could have driven a little man a little higher to see down the bond. Now what do you see? All right. Actually, let me uh, let me do the first one for you. We'll do it together, and then uh, then you guys um, you guys do the same one. Okay. But you guys on this side actually do this one here after we do the first. One. Okay. What does the little man see? We're looking down here. Front carbon, back carbon, right? Front carbon, back carbon. I want to draw what I see. What's on the front carbon? I see an F coming straight down. I'm in, pretend the board's right here. Isn't there an F coming straight down on the board? Yeah. I see an F coming straight down. I just want to draw that, but I'm going to draw it this way. F coming straight down. Front carbon has an F coming straight down. Okay, there's a chlorine on that carbon. The fact that it's dashed means it projected which way? Into the hall. Now if I'm looking here and there's something going through the hall, I'm just going to step away so I can put my hand out. The board's here. I'm looking down the board and that chlorine's going through the hall. Which side is it on? My side. It's on my left. The hall's to my left, yeah? So that chlorine's going to the left. And it's going up a little bit. To the left and up a little bit. As I'm looking down, I see a chlorine to the left and up a little bit. What's on that carbon coming towards you? An H. So if I'm looking through there, and there's an H coming out towards you, there it is coming out towards you, I'm looking through there, and that H is on my right. See it on my right? And H is here. That's the front carbon that I'm looking at. Now let's look past the front carbon, the second carbon. That's one and two. What do you want to draw there? I see an ethyl. Is that ethyl going towards you? No, it's not bold. Is it going? Is it dash going to the hall? No, it's going straight up in the board. The alpha is going straight up. I'm going to draw it like this. It's bonded to that carbon back in the back. It's bonded to, we can't see the two carbon. That's three and four. That's three and four. The two carbon is behind the behind it. And actually, you put, put, uh, put a chlorine uh, Here's the exact molecule. There's your backbone. I'm going to worry about that. Uh, here, we're doing here. The front carbon has a fluorine. Oh, fluorine's <coughs> red. Okay, fluorine's red. It's coming straight down. Chlorine is on that carbon, but it's going back. See how it's going away from you? That's what the dash means. Okay. Now, what am I drawing? It's very well see. Well, here's what I see. I'm going to show it to you. Okay? That's what I see. See, a fluorine coming straight down. So I drew it straight down. Here's a chlorine going to the left. That's why I drew it to the left. And what's this little guy? All right, now let's draw the back carbon. You do it here. By the way, when it's on your paper, it's, it's a touch easier because you can turn your paper. I can't turn the board. Sometimes you can turn your paper and look down the side. Okay, we already did the back. Straight up is there. What else is on that carbon? Uh, just basically draw the draw the H's. I mean, if that's staggered, they're going to be staggered. If we draw them in, I'm 
looking through there, I see one H coming towards you, and a little bit down, it's on my right, so when I draw it, it's on my right. Basically, there it is. But the question is, not just draw it, but draw it in the lowest energy confirmation. Is that the lowest energy confirmation? It is staggered, but is it the best staggered? Here's the take home. You want your biggest group's ante. Do we have the biggest group's ante? What's the biggest group's on the front carbon? Chlorine. What's the biggest group on the back carbon? H, H, or ethyl? Ethyl. Is the chlorine and ethyl ante? No. We've got to rotate it. See, it's, it's originally on the board like this. That's how it is on the board. But is the, the chlorine and that group need to be anti. We need to rotate the back group down so the chlorine and the ethyl are anti. On the board, we can just do this. I'm going to keep the chlorine the same. Where do we want the ethyl to be? We want it to be right there. I'm going to rotate this back. And this is sort of me rotating here. And now we get, I didn't change the front, chlorine, chlorine, H. When we rotate, the ethyl is going to come here, H here, and H here. It's just like we turn that back carbon and rotate it. And now we have the biggest groups anti, and that's going to be the preferred confirmation when this guy is just walking down the street or sitting on the sofa. It's going to prefer to be like this more often than the other way. Kendall. Could you turn the front carbon instead, or does it matter? You could turn the front carbon if you wanted to. Okay. We need to move on. I want you to do those two on your own. And we'll do them, uh, not Monday, because Monday we're off, right? Okay. We, uh, Tuesday we'll look at them. Okay. What we're learning is that all going to be on the test, or like where's the cutoff for what we're doing? Uh, a little bit on Tuesday. Okay. The idea was mainly mainly Tuesday to be starting second test material, but we're going to probably spill over Tuesday a little bit. Okay. Mainly probably just to to confirm these things. The next topic I want to introduce is the chair and uh, the chair and boat confirmations. That'll be the last topic for test one. So I want to get that introduced today. And then Tuesday, we'll just sort of answer the last question and do some problems. Okay. Uh, miscellaneous thing. Can sin or gal sometimes be preferred? Yeah. This molecule right here, when you draw the new one, the OH is actually preferred to be gauche instead of anti. Why do they prefer to be gauche? Hydrogen bonding. Because when they're gauche, look right there. Nice hydrogen bond between the O acceptor and the H donor. And so if these were OHs, okay, it's like, oh, I want to own hydrogen bond, so I'm going to be gal. If it's anti, it can't hydrogen bond, it can't reach. Okay? There's often exceptions to things. There's one right there. Hydrogen bond could keep those groups gauche, closer together. That's a case where the groups would be one closer together. I told you to kind of ignore van der Waals. Hydrogen bonding is strong. It'll, okay? This is a miscellaneous example. I also want you to do this. Name these compounds. That's basically going backwards. I would do this just like we did condensed formulas. You're looking down two carbons. I'm kind of just draw the carbons that you're looking down. What's on the front carbon? A methyl, that, and a bromine. Okay, what's on the back carbon? 
two H's, and the fluorine. And now you can name it, okay? It's just sort of going backwards, making sure you know what you're looking at. So if I ask you to name it, you name it right, I know you're looking at it right. Um, you, always, you always say looking down which bond, there is isn't like a preferred bond. It doesn't matter. It's the same compound, no matter which bond you look down. So do those. We'll uh, do those on Tuesday. Need to introduce the next topic. What did we do before? We had some terminology: anti, sin, gal. We know that anti is best. We need to know how to draw a Newman. We need to know how to rotate things. Typically, with your halogens, larger the halogen, the more it's the bigger group. Alkyls, ethyl is bigger than methyl. I mean, T butyl is bigger than methyl. Um, typically, it will hopefully always be clear which groups are bigger, just from that right there. And this problem is to work in the workbook. All right. Next topic is rings and six-membered rings. Cyclohexanes. Cyclohexanes exist in what's called chair conformations. Cyclohexane is, uh, the, although we draw it flat on the board, it's actually not flat because each carbon is what hybridization? SP3. be hexane. We can bond these back together. We can get the entropy right. Okay. Here's a cycle of hexane. Now if I try to make it flat, that is all six carbons in a plane, like, up there, like they're on the board, it, it didn't really want to do that. But if I do, it won't really do it. If I do, see that's kind of flat, like I'm holding a piece of paper this way. First off, look at the H's. Are they staggered or eclipsed? 
<coughs> closed. Okay, but also, what are the bond angles in a in a hexagon? They're greater than one hundred point five, aren't they? One twenty. I don't know, I had to go back to ninth grade geometry, but I think the bond angles in a hexagon is 120. It's not a flat hexagon. What happens is, one of these guys moves up, okay, or you've got forward, and the other, well, they could both be forward. See, I like that just better. But actually, one moves, moves forward, the other moves back. And what you actually have is there's four lined up, but one's forward and one's back. Almost like they're anti. Now instead of holding it forward, I'm going to turn it like this. One is up and one's down. Now if you look at H's, how are the H's? See, now they're staggered. And now the 109.5 is accommodated. Cyclohexane exists like this. And if you set it down, it's not flat on the table. And actually, only three H's hit the table instead of all, all six. And if you, can you see that, everybody? Make sure you can see the table. Uh, we have some terminology here. We actually have three H's straight down. Do you see there's also three up? One, two, and three, three up. Three straight down, and then three up. Those are called axial H's. Okay, you'll see that. The other H's, that one's neither up or down. It's not. Look, if we turn it over, the three that are straight up are now straight down and hitting the table. That one never hit the table. That's to the side. It's called equatorial, like the equator. Okay? But what we have to do is we have to be able to draw this on the board. How do you draw that on the board with, with that type of arrangement? or confirmation. It's called a confirmation. How do we draw it? I'm not going to try to look here. I'm just going to draw it for you. You do this by drawing two staggered lines like this. Okay? That's four carbons. One, two, three, four. We have to have one more carbon connected to these two. We just do a point up, down. And this one, we need one more carbon. We do a point up, down. And there you go. And that is supposed to be like this. I wish this was bigger. Four are kind of in that plane. But one is sort of pointing down. Can y'all see that at all? Does that look like what's drawn? See how this one's kind of pointing down? And then over here, this one's sort of up. That's it. These are you. This is your cyclohexane. This is called a chair confirmation. It's like you sit here, and that's your back, and your feet can hang over. Okay? Chair confirmation. Alternative is if we lift this point up here, and they're both up. Okay? That's where they're both up. That's called a boat. Kind of like an Italian gondola with the ends sticking up. Boat is not good. It'd rather be one up, one down. Why is boat no good? Well, it's almost like these, these groups here sort of interact. And actually, these H's here sort of interact. That's called flagpole hydrogens. They sort of interact. It would, you'd rather have this guy flip down. It's almost like it's, it's almost like it's sin. Yeah. You'd rather it flip down. But if you had OH on the end, would it be on Hydrogen bonding? Yeah. Perhaps. But we're, we're doing the standard yeah. case. Flip it down, and the take home is boat is preferred. And that's a boat. Chairs preferred. So now you know. <laughs> I don't know why that bond won't. The bond's a little weak there. 
Um, okay. We drew the carbons, but how do you draw the hydrogens? Well, there's two H's on each carbon. Well, here's how you draw them. Remember there was three that were straight down? Okay, they're straight down. Three of these carbons are I call down carbons. That one, that one, and that one are sort of down. Down carbons get down H's. Straight down, straight down. You kind of draw it like that and straight down. The other carbons are sort of up. They get straight up H's. Straight up, straight up. You can either draw this short or you, or you can put it up there and straight up. Those are your six, what do we call those H's? Those are your six axial H's. Straight up and straight down. The other six, you see, Uh, I've got this in down. I know everybody can't see this, but three H's are down. Three H's are straight up. The other H's are to the side. They're, they're uh, equatorial. How do you draw those in? You don't draw it just straight. The bond you put here is going to be parallel, not to the, the one on the carbon, but the next one. So it's going to be parallel to this. So it actually comes off like this. You can see how this is parallel? However you spell parallel. One, two L's. You see how that's parallel? All of your equator equatorials are parallel. This one is parallel, not to that bond, but the next one. And you would not draw it here. You always draw it so it's going to be sort of like this. Here, not the, not the other carbon bond, but the next one. It's almost, it's almost getting close to that. Here, not parallel to that, but to that. So this comes up like this. This guy here, not parallel to that, but to that. So it sort of comes like that. Back here, not parallel to that, but to that, so it sort of comes up like that. It's supposed to be parallel. And so this is your equatorial H's. And there's your cyclohexane in a chair conformation. Now, which position axial equatorial is preferred if you put a big group on this ring? It turns out the equatorial is favored. It may just have to be a, a take home of a given. Equatorial is favored, there's more room. Why there's more room. If I put a group on here, this alkene, if it's, if it's axial, it interferes with these other two H's over here. That's called 1-3 diaxial interactions. And that's the main reason. Basically, it has to be sort of just a take on. It's preferred that this thing will be equatorial. And there's not as many interactions with it now on either side as if it was axial. Equatorial is favored. Now, the ring can undergo what's called a ring flip. And this would be sort of like the other thing, rotate. This could come down and this could come up. When it undergoes a ring flip, all axial H's move to equatorial, and all equatorials move to axial. Okay? Let's put a group on one. 
whatever that is. That's a labeled H, or maybe that's a full ring. That's supposed to be a bond or more weak. That's supposed to be a chair with the fluorine in what position? Yes. It's supposed to be a chair with the fluorine axis. I see the fluorine straight up. Now let's do a ring flip. I'm going to pull this up and this down. Now it's a ring flip, and now the chair is here, the back is here. All right. Now, where's the flooring? Equatorial. Now it's equatorial. When you do a ring flip, okay. So, basically you have two conformations, not 360 all the way around. Which is going to be preferred? Confirmation with the flooring axial? Or the confirmation with the flooring equatorial? Equatorial. Okay. But the two are different conformations. One, in this case, has a higher energy than the, uh, than the other because fluorine equatorial is going to have a lower potential energy. Um, how do we do ring flip? I'll show you ring flip, uh, but then we're not really going to ever do ring flips. We'll just draw it how it should be drawn. Ring flip, this comes down and this goes up. How do you draw it that way? To do this one, I drew bonds like this. To show the ring flip, let's actually put fluorine here. Okay? Right there in that position. To do a ring flip, you draw your bonds sort of the other way. Then you connect them like this. And so now you have this point is now down, and that point is now up. Okay? Now we can put our H's on. Let's complete this structure here. Up. And up. Down, down, down. Equatorial, where's the fluorine at? It's on this carbon that we pulled down. Is it now equatorial or axial? Yeah. Okay, then it should be here. It should be here. Uh, I'm going to put the F underneath like I did over there. It should now be there. And this is here. This is important. This group is always below the H. See how it's below that H? Okay, that's F. Over here, it's below the H. It's always going to be below the H. But over there below the H is equatorial. Over here below the H is axial. Okay? Uh, need about 10 more minutes. Please do this for Tuesday, okay? You can do the problems and then we'll see how you do with the problems and answer questions. Problems are here. Identify things like this. Identify cis or trans. Are these groups cis or trans? Be like here. Show this in the most stable conformation. Okay. 